Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the American Sports Connection. I am your host, the one and only Joey Railroads. I have a very special guest with me today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome CZW Zone, Jeff Cannonball. Jeff, how you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. How you doing today, Joey? I'm doing well. Uh, just trying to get out of this funk where we've had all the rain and the cold. and. <laughs> I hear you. I hate that stuff. Oh, uh, I wish it would just either be warm or be cold, not this like 60 one day <laughs> and then like 30 the next. Right. That's why everybody's sick now. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Now, um, Je I was a fan growing up, Jeff, of uh, Hulk Hogan. That's where my wrestling fandom started. Like my dad took me to SummerSlam at the old Spectrum I think the main event was Hogan, or excuse me, Warrior and Rude in a Cage. Uh, my question is, were you a fan growing up? And if you were, like, what was the moment that you're like, this is my, this is my shit. This is what I want to do, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I was always a fan for as long as I can remember. Um, you know, I actually, I used to tell people I was a fan since I was four years old and things like that. And then my mom heard me say that once and she goes, no, you were watching it before that. Um, so I don't even really know what initially got me into it. My dad was into it, but my first actual memory of wrestling was being a kid and my dad brought home a VHS and it was WrestleMania three. Cool. And even though it's, even though it's my first memory, I know it's not the first time I watched wrestling because I remember specifically at the time being really excited that I finally get to watch Hulk Hogan versus Andre the giant. So I don't know where it started, but I know that that's like the first real standout memory. Um, However, I was never a huge Hogan fan. Like I, I liked him as a kid because, you know, he was Hulk Hogan. Everybody liked him. But for me, the Ultimate Warrior was always number one. Uh, he was the, my favorite guy when I was a kid. He, was, he came out to the loud music, the face paint, the tassels, running around like a maniac. It was everything like a little, little annoying, obnoxious kid liked, and that was me. So like <laughs> everything he did I thought was the coolest thing in the world. Yeah, I was going to say, and he had like the, the weird – you know, out of this world, like promos that he would cut, like it would be like you said, everything a kid would like. <laughs> yeah. And as I got older, like, like my interests as I got older were like, you know, like loud punk music <laughs> and, and deathmatch wrestling. And I feel like warrior, <laughs> while he wasn't a deathmatch guy, he was still this maniac and he was this loud, fast presence. And so I feel like that just kind of translated as I got older and older still. I got gotcha. you. Now, you were actually trained by Corey Havoc and Corvus Fear, correct? Yeah, uh, I got my start training with uh, Corey Havoc and another guy named Nicky Oceans. Um, Corey Havoc kind of was really like the guy who kind of got me started, brought me in. And then uh, Nicky Oceans helped out a lot. And then, yeah, as I got a little bit like, uh, I don't want to say more experience because I was still, you know, nothing and I was still, you know, at best, terrible. Uh, I started going to, to uh, train with Corvus Fear, and that's kind of where I did a lot more, like, I guess I guess you could say advanced kind of things and kind of just started kind of expanding my knowledge. Gotcha. Now, what was it your experience like working, uh, you know, learning from those guys? Uh, with with Corey Havoc and, and Nikki Oceans especially, um, they were all about paying your dues and respect. So I learned, like, right off the bat, I learned a lot about etiquette, like locker room etiquette, and how to how to behave and how to present yourself. Um, so a lot of times I'd show up and it would be me and one other guy, and we'd be the only two guys setting the ring up. And you know, if you complain, they're gonna beat the shit out of you. Uh, and so it would be me and this other guy, and I remember him. His name was uh, B Firm. I don't think he wrestles anymore. 
but he was probably about 130 pounds tops. Oh, wow. So I'd be busting my ass, and he would too, but, like, it's just I'm such a bigger dude and just kind of naturally stronger than him that, like, I did a majority of the work just because that's just kind of how it happens when you have that change in, in body type. Yeah. Um, so I learned a lot about respect right off the bat, and, and that's something I kind of really appreciate because – a lot of times you see people who don't know how to behave and you don't know who don't know how to act. And so people, they rub people the wrong way right off the bat. And, and luckily, um, I mean, as far as I know, I've never been one of those people. Right. Well, that, that's, I've heard a lot of that where there's certain talent, younger talent now that kind of rub people the wrong way by doing, you know, certain things here or there. So that's, that's cool that you learned that early on. Yeah. Now, you actually wrestle in both death matches and regular matches. Uh, I always wanted to ask death match guys, is there like a different mindset going into a death match than when you would just say wrestle a normal straight one-on-one -on -one contest? Sure. Um, I mean, with any kind of wrestling, things could happen. Accidents could happen. You can get hurt more than you're expecting to, and you kind of don't know what's going to come. Um, but when you do a death match, there is more of that mindset where it's like, all right, this is going to hurt more than it usually does. Uh, I'm going to bleed. I'm going to get cut. I'll probably have something stuck in me by the end of this match. Um, and so you kind of got to go in there with the mindset of just like, let's just go fucking kill it. Let's just go do this and, and, and make it the best we can. Um, cause if you, if you hesitate or if you, if you double like second guess yourself, I'm sorry. Um, that's where, you know, something could go wrong and you can get even more hurt. And so I've always kind of tried to go into it with just, you know, full speed ahead, just get in there and do your thing. Right. Kind of like just balls to the wall, so to speak. Sure. And, and I mean, you got to do that with, with standard wrestling matches as well, but there's just, there's a whole, it, it heightens your senses when you're doing the death matches. Cause you have to be expecting to have a little bit more happen to you. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like you're kind of more obvious of like, Hey, I gotta do this a certain way or I could get really fucked up. <laughs> right. And you're going to get fucked up either way. That's just, that comes with the territory, you know? Right. I was, I meant kind of like just even more so than maybe you normally sure, would. Sure. Yeah. Now you were in one of the moments in the vice documentary on TOD with uh i'm gonna try and pronounce it the the kenzing uh the kenzin yeah yeah where it got stuck in your head and it had to get pulled out that's one of the more crazier moments on that uh my question was what was that experience like for you being in tournament of death and to actually have vice do like a documentary and follow you guys around for tournament of death uh, for me, being in Tournament of Death was kind of like everything. Um, I'm realistic, and like I know I'm I'm a I'm a five foot ten fat kid from the suburbs of New Jersey. You know, I'm not I'm not your typical WWE type person, and I've always kind of wrestled with that mindset where it's like, you know, it'd be great, and if they call me, I'll I'll go there tomorrow. I'll drop everything, you know. Right. But it's also at the same time been one of those things where it's like this isn't this realistically it's not going to happen. My goal, my top goal has always been CZW and namely Tournament of Death because as a fan, Tournament of Death was my favorite show. Like everybody says Cage of Death is the WrestleMania. For me, Tournament of Death was the WrestleMania. And Cage of Death was just as cool, don't get me wrong. But TOD was my favorite show to go to. So to get to perform in in Tournament of Death, um, in, in my first match ever in CZW was Tournament of Death. Uh, that was that was surreal. Like, you know, like it's, it was just validation for, for six, almost seven years of hard work and everything that I worked for came to that moment, which was awesome. Um, and it made it cool, too, because, cause like you said, Vice was there. And the guy who hosted the documentary, Damien Abraham, he's the guy with – he's the bald guy with the beard in the documentary. Yeah. Um, we have like we never met each other, but we have mutual friends and like we knew of each other. So like we got to talking there, we hit it off right away. So it was cool. I got to like meet him there finally, and we we kept we keep in touch right to this day. I was texting with him yesterday. Um, so it was really cool. I like, get to meet him and like everything kind of came together. Where it's like 
I'm, I'm doing this big goal I have in wrestling. Plus, I'm making this new friend, and me and him are hitting it off awesome. And then I had that thing stuck in my head, and it became a very big part of the documentary. Um, not in terms of length, but people bring that part up to me almost every single day now. I um, bet. I've had people. I've had people who I haven't talked to in like four or five years, like somebody I used to work with um, like a long time ago on Facebook the other day. He tagged me in a in a video or in the video and he goes is this you and i was like yeah that's me i'm sorry about that <laughs> and so like it's cool like it, it's been like it's kind of brought this like new like like recognition to me and I, it's been awesome it's been a lot of fun to be seen for that but uh it's not something i want to relive anytime soon though either i was gonna say because we had talked about this before on the vice documentary they only show once or twice them trying to pull that out. And you said it took like about five or six times, right? Oh yeah. I was sitting there like in the documentary, it's probably, I think a 40, 50 second clip. Um, in person though, that took about five, five minutes of just trying. Like they don't show it in the documentary, but first, um, Shawnee, the security guard, he's trying to do it. He can't get it. So then one of the doctors starts doing it. He can't get it. And then both of them try it together. They don't get it. And, like, it went on for a while. And they don't have all of it in there at all. Um, that's why, like, in the documentary, you hear me ask George Gatton. I go, hey, are you holding my head? Because earlier in it, or not in the documentary, but earlier in that experience, um, I could feel the skin coming off my my scalp. And so I got nervous about that. I go, hey, George, can you just, like, hold my scalp? skin down because it's freaking me out a little bit more um so yeah, that took a long time and they, they only use so much of it which i get you can't put that in there for a full five minutes but it was that was not fun no i that was and i mean this in the nicest way one of the more cringeworthy moments oh i i i hear you i've heard i've heard from a lot of people saying that they had to turn it off at that point no i, I was a trooper and still watched it but that was just like oh god <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Now, who is your favorite guy to work in the business? Uh, for me, it's Matt Tremont's been my favorite guy just because we've we've wrestled <laughs> against each other several times. We've tagged a bunch of times. We've been in triple threats together, um, and and he's helped me more than anybody else in this business. Like he's the reason that you've probably even heard of me. He's the reason the majority of people have actually heard of me. I was wrestling for. Uh, I think four years before he started helping me out. And once he started helping me out, my, my name value just started growing and growing faster than ever. Um, so, like, I, I, he means a lot to me. So getting to work with him all the time is awesome, like whether we're tagging or going against each other. Um, another one lately, and I've been having really good matches with every time we've been in the ring, is G-Raver. Um, we, we wrestled each other for the first time in uh, Lords of Anarchy, the VOW Deathmatch Tournament. And we had a great match, and it was it was real hard, like real hard hit and real brutal. I went to the hospital after the match for stitches, which I've only done that time. I've never done that before. Um, and then we re we faced off again uh, this past Saturday, or I'm sorry, Sunday, at On Point Wrestling's fourth year anniversary uh, in a cinder blocks and carpet strips match, and. You know, maybe I'm being overzealous right now, but in my opinion, that might be the best match I've ever had. I got to tell you, from watching him on Sunday and then going and YouTubing a lot of his shit, G Raver is one crazy fucking dude for his size. <laughs> oh, yeah. He can, and it's cool because, like, he's, he's, you know, he's on the smaller side compared to a lot of Deathmatch guys. But if you look, like, you can find a match it's from the first Lords of Anarchy tournament, it's him versus Masada. And Masada's no joke, and he'll fuck you up. And G Raver's taking it, and he's giving it right back. So, yeah. so he he might be smaller than a lot of us, but he's he's just as tough as anybody. Like you can't take anything away from him. No, I'll I'll tell you this. Well, I, and I'll segue into this. When you had the carpet strips and cinder block match, there was a spot in that match. I can't remember exactly what it was. Well, I was in the third row with my best friend. And they shot up, and they almost hit me right in the face. I had to, like, put my hands up <laughs> so I didn't get hit. Yeah, uh, I actually know exactly what you're talking about. And the only reason I do is because um, yesterday or, or the day before, I was talking to Arcadia, 
and he was telling me that he was watching the match, and uh, at some point, a bunch of Carver Fishers went flying into the audience, and he got scared that the show was over and somebody was going to get hurt. Um, but what happened was I was laying down on my stomach, and G-Raver put all of these carpet strips on my back, and then he put a cinder block on top, and then he came off the top rope and double stomped it. When he rolled off, and uh, he rolled off and it pulled the carpet strips forward, which I have a good amount of cuts of me right now from. Uh, but the cinder block fell and it hit him and it slingshot them into the crowd where people such as yourself probably got a little closer to the match than they expected to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now that was it. It really was an awesome match. But um, now, what has been like the most violent match you've actually been in? So in your career, uh, the most violent match is easily um, it was CZW's Night of Infamy from uh, November last year, two thousand sixteen. Um, me and Tremont faced off against Josh Crane and Dale Patricks, and it was no rope barbed wire. Plus, we took the mats off the ring and replaced them with barbed wire boards. So oh anytime you fell, anytime you yeah, anytime you fell or rolled over or anything happened, you're getting ripped up from barbed wire. Anytime you get thrown into the ropes, they're barbed wire. Um, on top of that, there was a board with a bunch of plastic forks sticking out of it. We had a scaffold, and we had cinder blocks, plus a bunch of chairs got used, and people fell off high things. And by far, that will probably keep the uh, title of most violent match I've ever had for a long time, just because... No matter what, you couldn't catch a break. There was barbed wire literally everywhere. It just, everything hurt. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, that sounds awful. Yeah. Oh, and we had a bed of nails. I forgot about that part, which wasn't fun because I got to feel that one. Ooh. <laughs> that, that's, yeah, but that, that, was, does, that does not sound pleasant. No, that was, that was a disgusting match, but it, it was a good one. I recommend checking it out, though. Okay, now, what is the dream match for you in the business? As far as death matches go, because I know that's what everybody always kind of asks and that's what I like, want to know. Um, there's a lot of guys who I have never gotten to work and, and unfortunately won't because, you know, there's guys like Necro Butcher who, who are retired or Drake Younger who's now working for WWE yeah. and, and people like that. Um, the one person who's still doing it who was a big influence on me when I first started getting into American death matches was Madman Pondo. Um, and he's still wrestling, so I hope, you know, I'm really hoping that one day that gets to happen. That's like my big one. Yeah, he, he I remember him from old CZW back in the early 2000s. <laughs> yeah, and he's still, he's still going strong. He still kills it. That's crazy. Yeah, and I was always a big fan of his, like he, because he was like me. He's this goofy fat guy, but he was getting violent. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like what I wanted to do when I was younger, you know? So uh, he's a big one for me. Okay, well, that's cool. Now, you were actually, we talked about Tournament of Death, but you were actually in the main event of Cage of Death this year. Uh, you know, that's one, probably the second biggest event, depending on who you talk to in right. uh, CZW. What was, what was that moment like for you main eventing Cage of Death? You know, that was, that was, that was crazy too. Like I said, like, like I said before, for me, TOD was the big deal. Um, but that's taking nothing away from Cage of Death because that really, that really is the CZW big show. Um, so like to get to do that in TOD in my, my rookie year in the company was awesome. Um, I always, you know, I, I have a big problem with, with self doubt and, and, you know, selling myself oh, short, boy. something that I've been given stern talking to from, from Danny Havoc plenty of times. Uh, I'm working on that now. Um, but I always thought, you know, I'm not good enough for the cage match. I will be in the undercard of the CZW. I'll be in the, the undercard death match of the cage of death show, but probably never man of ending it because that's crazy. That's huge. That's for the guys who are the best. Um, and now here I am, my first Cage of Death card ever, and I'm in the main event. And that was just mind-blowing to me. Yeah, I was going to say that that would have to be surreal from where you went and did TOD and Cage of Death all in a calendar year. Yeah, and the only thing I wish that was different about Cage was with Tournament of Death, I kind of had a second to take it all in. You know, get in the ring and just kind of look around and go, you know, I fucking did it. Like, here I am. Um... And, and all that, but with Cage, 
uh, it was war game style. So like two guys started and then somebody else came and then I was the fourth person in the match. So by the time I got in there, it was just go, 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 go. There was no time to like, I know what you're saying where take it in. Didn't have time to soak it in. You're just getting beat up the second you walk in. Right. Like, there was no time to just stand there and go, here we are. Like we did this. So, so like, I kind of, I kind of regret that I didn't find a part where I could just kind of be like, you know, decompress and just take it in real quick. Yeah. But it's cage of death. You're, you're not going to find time to do that. You know, I was going to say, no, I, I wouldn't think you would because when it's war game style and you have that many people in like a, a short area in a ring, you're not going to have, you know, a breather. <laughs> right. Exactly. Now, what can we expect from you in the future? Um, I mean, I don't want to think too far ahead, so, so I'll just go with this year. Uh, 2016 is is kind of like, I, I don't want to say a breakout year, because I feel like 2015 is when I first started really getting out there a little bit more. Um, but 2016, I did my first IWA Mid-South King of the Death matches. I did uh, my first TOD, my first Cage of Death. I did... Uh, VOW's Lords of Anarchy tournament for the first time, On Point Survival the Sickest for the first time. Um, I did all these tournaments, and and almost all of them I was one and done. You know, I lost in the first round. Um, it's an honor, and it's a big deal to get to even be in tournaments, especially ones like Tournament of Death and the, and King of the Death, because they're so prestigious in the, in the deathmatch world. Um, but I think for 2017, working hard and really kind of going after my goals, my goal is to win one of these. Um, whether it's King of the Death, whether it's Tournament of Death, or On Point Survival of the Sickest, because, it's, and I've told a lot of people this, um, On Point for me is like, that's the home base. Um, they're the ones who got me in the public eye more. They got me help being seen by DJ Hyde, which got me into CZW and stuff. So Matt Tremont and, and Loudy from On Point, like, I, I, I'm so indebted to them. Um, and they run Survival of the Sickest. Last year was the first one I lost in the first round to Low Life Louie, who went on to win it in probably the most emotional finale to a deathmatch tournament of all time. Um, so to win Survival of the Sickest in May, that would be so important to me. As much as it might not be a tournament of death or king of the death in terms of like you know how long it's been around, how big it is, on point for me is so special that winning that tournament would mean just as much to me as winning tournament of death and, and king of the death and et cetera, et cetera, all those other ones. Um, right. So yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I know exactly what you're saying because it's like on point was the one that kind of gave you your big break in a way. Right. And I'm, I, I'm, I love it there. You know, like I could not say a bad thing about them. Every show there is great. And, and I have a good time. That's one of my favorite locker rooms to be a part of. So winning their deathmatch tournament would be so important to me. Okay, cool. Now, how can people get a hold of you on social media if they want to contact you? Uh, the easiest way is, is just at Jeff Cannonball. Uh, I'm on Instagram all the time. I love Instagram. You can I'll post pictures from whatever I did that weekend as far as wrestling goes, and then I'll post pictures of my three-legged cat every once in a while. Uh, I love Instagram. And uh, I'm at Jeff Cannonball on Twitter. I don't use it as much, but I'm trying to get better with that. Um, Facebook, you can find me. Uh, you probably have to look for my real name, I think. It's Jeff Guerrero because Facebook went and stopped me from using my surprisingly fake last name of Cannonball. Apparently, it's not a common name anymore. Uh, so they, they yelled at me. They sent me a message saying I can't do that anymore, and I had to change my Facebook to my real name. That's crazy. Um, yeah, it sucks, but like – it's probably been almost a year now, so it's kind of like, what can I do at this point? Right. Um, but if you search Jeff Cannonball, that'll probably pop up too because I got to put it in parentheses. Like they were nice enough to do that for me at least. But <laughs> thank you, Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, but I tried to get around it. Um, I don't. I don't think I told you this. Uh, when they first sent me the message, like, hey, you have to prove that Cannonball is your real last name. I posted something like, hey, does anybody, has anybody ever dealt with this? And um, a buddy of mine, he, he works more in, like, the Colorado and Las Vegas scene. Uh, his name's Mosh Pit Mike. He sent me a message that he got the message, that same, like, style of message. Uh -huh. And what he did was he photoshopped his, his driver's license to say Mosh Pit Mike on it. <laughs> and, and it worked. So, like, if you search Mosh Pit Mike, you'll find him. 
So I tried to do that, and I don't know if I wasn't as good at Photoshop or what, but That's it got me. It got me clear for like another two weeks, and then they were just like, "No, never mind. You're you're not Jeff Cannonball." So I had to use my real name. <laughs> Now, you actually have, uh, like, a website that you sell your merch on, too, correct? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for reminding me. You're better at this than I am. <laughs> uh, uh, it's ridethefury.bigcartel.com. Um, it's actually a buddy of mine's uh, web store. He does it because he does, like, enamel pins, like those fancy, like, lapel pins. Yes. And they're all wrestling way. They're cool. Th they're cool. Like, I, I don't – this isn't me plugging my stuff, like, because he gets money off his stuff. I don't get any money off his stuff. Um, right now he's got a Shockmaster pin. He's got a million dollar belt pin coming out, which I don't think he's announced, but I talk to him every day. He doesn't listen to podcasts I'm on because he's heard all my stories. Um, so I could, I'll, I'll leak that now. Just don't go tell him Pat Garrity. Um, I don't know nothing. But, <laughs> but yeah, if you go on the website though, um, he, he also, he's kind enough. He lets me sell my shirts on there. So I got uh, a couple left of the picture of me putting a staple gun through my tongue. That's on a shirt. I think there's like three of those left. And then I got like six left of the long sleeves. They're all 2X and 3X. But if you're a big dude like me, you know, go pick those up. That'd mean a lot to me. I was going to say, for I'll... the husky gentleman. Yeah, that's what I got right now. I, I surprisingly sold out of the small sizes real quick. Oh, but, that's cool. you know, I won't complain. I appreciate that, too. But, yeah, uh, Pat's been cool, though. He lets me sell my shirts on there, plus... Uh, if you're a fan of Arcadia or Billy Avery, they both have their shirts up on the site, too. Okay, well, that's cool. All right, then, everybody. We're going to get out of here for today. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, give a thumbs up, all that good stuff. And we'll see you back next time. Have a good night, everybody.